Hello, everyone. Um, we're back again. UC's first year going on second year very soon, Poetry Cohort. Um, and we have a special guest joining us today. She will introduce herself. Um, but again, my name is Taylor Bias. I'm Connor Yuck. I'm Nick Mulbear. I'm Marianne Chan. Uh, and I'm Adithi Machado. Awesome. Um, so I guess uh, my poem is um, up first. Um, so I am reading um, a poem that um, I've actually had up on my wall for a very long time. Um, and can you guys see this? Not yet. We're loading. Yes. We're loading. Awesome. Um, so it's uh, The Planet Krypton by Lynn uh, Emanuel. Um, and people in the program know my interest in the atomic um so that's this might not be a surprise for reading this poem but um it's also just a piece that is like hot to the touch um in a really kind of fascinating way um so i've always really enjoyed it so uh, this is the planet krypton by lynn emmanuel outside the window the mcgill smelter sent a red dust down on the smoking yards of copper on the railroad tracks frayed and disappeared into the congestion of the afternoon Eli lay dull and scuffed, a miner's boot toe worn away and dim, while my mother knelt before the Philco to coax the detonation from the static. From the Las Vegas Tonopah artillery and gunnery range, the sound of the atom bomb came biting like a swarm of bees. We sat in the hot Nevada dark, delighted, when the switch was tripped and the bomb hoisted up its silky, hooded, glittering, uncoiling length. It hissed and spit. It sizzled like a poker in a potty. The bomb was no mind and all body. It sent a fire of static down the spine. In the dark, it glowed like the coils of an electric stove. It stripped every leaf from every branch until a willow by a creek was a bouquet of switches resinous, naked, flexible, and fine. Bathed in the light of KDWN Las Vegas, my crouched mother looked radioactive, swampy, glaucous, like something from the planet Krypton. In the suave, brilliant wattage of the bomb, we were not poor. In the atoms fizz and pop, we heard possibility uncorked. Taffeta wraps whispered on Davenports. A new planet bloomed above us. In its light, the stumps of cut pine gleamed like dinner plates. The world was beginning all over again, fresh and hot. We could have anything we wanted. All right. That was awesome. Okay, um, I'm going to read uh, a poem by Seamus Sini. I think most of you have read this poem before. Um, it is in um, his selected poems, Open Ground. Um, and I'm going to read it from the Poetry Foundation. I could just press play and have him read it himself. <laughs> Reading is better than mine, but I'll read it. So this is called Digging. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, snug as a gun. Under my window, a clean rasping sound. When the spade sinks into gravelly ground, my father digging, I look down till his straining rump among the flower beds bends low, comes up 20 years away, stooping in rhythm through, through potato drills where he was digging. The coarse boot nestled on the lug, the shaft against the inside knee has, was levered firmly. He rooted out tall tops, buried the bright edge deep to scatter new potatoes that we picked, loving their cool hardness in our hands. By God, the old man could handle a spade just like his old man. My grandfather cut more turf in a day than any other man on Toner's Bog. Once I carried him milk in a bottle, corked sloppily with paper. He straightened up to drink it, then fell to right away, nicking and slicing neatly heaving sods over his shoulder, going down and down for the good turf, digging. The cold smell of potato mold, the squelch and slap of soggy peat, the curt cuts of an edge, through living roots awaken in my head, but I've no spade to follow men like them. Between my finger and my thumb, the squat pen rests, I'll dig with it. All right, am I next? Yes. Okay. I think I have to unshare, hold on one second, you guys. 
<laughs> Sharon, there we go. Okay. Hi. And I'm going to uh, I'm gonna read a poem uh, by a poet named Nico Rosenthalis. Nico Rosenthalis. It's how he publishes. Can you see the poem? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and it's published in Nightblock Mag edition 11. Um, and I picked this poem because I've been on a kick uh, reading and cataloging poems that address the future, sort of starting with Sean Bonney's It's Been Cancelled It, How It Futurity. Oh, I'm messing that up, but that's kind of Futurity is cancelled. That's the idea. Um, and this is called The Mayor Writes a Letter. It is your life. I carry a gun to nudge you along. I load it, polish it in your light. Now you can see what the rainbow is. I can argue for its rainbow effect. Sing for me. The high rise of the future I'll fill in later. A grid that's mobile with dogs and cats and the chit chat of birds and the judgment of their experience. Likewise, I authorize the necessity of tearing up Fright tunnels, dirty little brick houses, streets with ingenious surface. Pedal me to a site, and you will take a universally employed balloon. Mark my words. I do. I love you. Now love me from behind your disaffection, your exquisite cause. I wake up to drink more water. I look up at the clock and say good night. Haunting will arise like so many whistles just as the throat of the cow will be cut, and presto, glue, gelatin, jewelry, hair restorer, soda and soap, bread spring, fertilizer. Would you apologize for that? I have no sympathy, no truck. Surface traffic goes on. Look at the scheme. 5,000 trucks, 3,820 hogs, 4 million persons collaborate every day a larger hole in the lots might be needed to remove the waste. I want not. Unlike you, who are the season of undeliverables, you with your pocket-sized squabbles that leak air, which I condition with structures up to nowhere, and that's the electric agreement. More bodies, please. Zooms. A factory for daylight itself, and no mirror park to evacuate the blind ends of plan. I will make you move again. Yellow, sullen smokes disguise the blessings of the blue. It's all industrial. Accident, unforeseen as coordinated health plans converge on the sick to squeeze in true cost. It's the rubdown I admire. The virgin trouble of sound. Each note I put in my ledger is for you. Help me make the latter day the expressway of my dreams. Don't make me beg. Reinforce your radical. Our river is great. It flows. All right. Let's see. <clears throat> I'm next, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to read a poem by Robert Hass um, called Fame Music. Um, it, since I first read this a few years ago, it's always um, struck me at how kind of ambitious and like multifaceted it is. Um, so yeah, I return to it uh, to learn. Faint music. Maybe you need to write a poem about grace when everything is, when everything broken is broken and everything dead is dead. And the hero has looked into the mirror with complete contempt and the heroine has studied her face and its defects remorselessly and the pain they thought might as a token of their earnestness release them from themselves has lost its novelty and not release them and they have begun to think kindly and distantly watching the others go about their days likes and dislikes reasons habits, 
fears that self-love self-love is the one weedy stalk of every human blossoming and understood therefore why they had been all their lives in such a fury to defend it and that no one except some almost inconceivable saint in his pool of poverty and silence can escape this violent automatic life's companion ever maybe then ordinary light faint music under things a hovering like grace appears as in the story a friend told once about the time he tried to kill himself his girl had left him bees and a heart then scorpions maggots and then ash he climbed onto the jumping girder of the bridge the bayside a blue lucid afternoon and in the salt air he thought about the word seafood that there was something faintly ridiculous about it no one said land food he thought it was degrading to the rainbow perch he'd reeled in gleaming from the cliffs the black rock bass scales like polished carbon in beds of kelp along the coast and he realized that the reason for the word was crabs or mussels clams Otherwise, the restaurants could just put fish up on their signs. And when he woke, he'd slept for hours, curled up on the girder like a child. The sun was going down, and he felt a little better and afraid. He put on the jacket he'd used for a pillow, climbed over the railing carefully, and drove home to an empty house. There was a pair her lemon yellow panties hanging on a doorknob he studied them much washed a faint russet in the crotch that made him sick with rage and grief he knew more or less where she was a flat somewhere on russian hill they'd have just finished making love she'd have tears in her eyes and touch his jawbone gratefully god she'd say you were so good for me Winking lights, a foggy view downhill toward the harbor and the bay. You're sad, he'd say. Yes. Thinking about Nick? Yes, she'd say and cry. I tried so hard, sobbing now. I really tried so hard. And then he'd hold her for a while, Guatemalan weavings from his field work on the wall, and then they'd fuck again, and she would cry. that scene once only once and a half and tell himself that he was going to carry it for a very long time and that there was nothing he can do but carry it he went out onto the porch and listened to the forest in the summer dark madrone bark cracking and curling as the cold came up it's not the story though not the friend leaning toward you saying and then i realized which is the part of stories one never quite believes. I had the idea that the world so full of pain, it must sometimes make a kind of singing and that the sequence helps as much as order helps first an ego and then pain and then the singing. Stop. Okay. Um, I'm going to read a Ross Gay poem, and this poem is in his book, Bringing the Shovel Down. Um, let's see, share the screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read um, Prayer for My Unborn Niece or Nephew. I really love this poem. It's one of my favorites in the book. So this is the one that I'm going to read. Prayer for my unborn niece or nephew. Today, November 28th, 2005, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I am staring at my hands and the common pose of the hungry and penitent. I am staring in the emptiness of my clasped hands, wherein I see my sister-in-law days from birthing the small thing which will erase, in some sense, the mystery of my father's departure. 
their child will emerge with ten fingers and toes, howling, and his mother will hold his gummy mouth to her breast, and the stars will hang above them, and not one bomb will be heard through that night. And my brother will stir, waking his wife, waking with his wife the first few days, and he will run his long fingers along the soft terrain of his child's skull, and not once will he cover the child's ears or throw the two to the ground and cover them from the blasts. And this child will gaze into a night which is black and quiet. She will pull herself up to her feet, standing like a buoy in wind-grooved waters, falling and rising again, never shaken by an explosion and her grandmother will watch her stumble through a park or playground, will watch her sail through the air on swings, howling with joy, and never once will she snatch her from the swing and run for shelter because again, the bombs are falling. The two will drink cocoa, the beautiful lines in my mother's face growing deeper as she smiles at the beautiful boy flipping the pages of a book with pictures of dinosaurs and no bomb will blast glass into this child's face, leaving the one eye clueless. No bomb will loosen the roof, crush other while this child's plaster and wood and blood where once his Nana sat. This child will not sit with his Nana, killed by a bomb for hours. I will never drive across two states to help my brother bury my mother this way to pray and weep and beg this child to speak again. She will go to school with other children and some of them will have more food than others and some will be the witnesses of great crimes and some will describe flavors with colors and some will have seizures and some will read two grade levels ahead but none of them will tip their desks and shield their faces nor watch as their teacher falls out of her shoes clinging to the nearest child. This child will bleed and cry and curse his living parents and slam doors and be hurt and hurt again. And she will feed clover, feel clover on her bare feet, will swim in frigid waters, will cry, climb trees and spy cardinal chicks be blind and peeping. And no bomb will kill this child's parents. No bomb will kill this child's grandparents. No bomb will kill this child's uncles and no bomb will kill this child who will raise to his mouth some small morsel of food of which there is more while bombs fall from the sky like dust brushed from the hands of a stupid god and children whose parents name them will become dust and their parents will drape themselves in black and dream of the tiny mouse which once reared to suckle or gasp at some bird sailing by and their te tears will make a mud which will heal nothing. And today I will speak no word except the name of that child whose absence makes the hands of her parents shiver, a name which had a meaning, as will yours. Okay, and that's the end of our reading for this week, and we will have another one next week as usual, but thank you for joining us and we will see you again soon. Bye.